Hey everyone, welcome back to Cyber Grey Matter. In today's video, we're going to be going over the Zero Trust model, including the three main fundamental principles, some common protocols, and what may make implementing and maintaining Zero Trust in an environment challenging. I'd like to thank everyone who has subscribed and liked previous videos, so let's jump right into it. In 1994, Stephen Paul Marsh wrote a doctoral thesis on computational security at the University of Stirling, where he mentioned Zero Trust. Later on in 2010, Zero Trust made its way back and was popularized by John Kindervog, who is now one of the world's foremost cybersecurity experts. Within his research, he focused on and explained how important non-trust was in relation to network traffic, even if it's internal. This is important because this came from a time where most businesses kept their network and storage in-house without the vulnerabilities of the internet. Zero Trust isn't an appliance that an organization uses from a vendor, but there are vendors who use the model and concept that is reflected in their products. This model can be implemented in many different ways, such as firewalls and IM, also known as identity access management. We'll go over this later in the video. The guiding principles of the Zero Trust model, according to the DoD, are never trust, always verify, assume breach, and verify explicitly. Let's start with never trust, always verify. Every single user, device, application, or network flow needs to be allowed to be on the network. This principle is related to least privilege, which is one of the main components of zero trust, and is something you may have heard of before. Least privilege is only giving access to what is necessary. An example of this would be when you visit a public website. Usually you're able to access the website, but you can't edit or upload files. Granting the least privilege involves granting enough that the user can do what they need to do, complete their task, not granting enough would impact availability, but granting too much creates more risk than necessary. Additionally, everything needs to be authenticated and explicitly authorized, and this will be governed by dynamic security policies. Number two is assume breach. Within a zero trust network, the network will always be assumed to be hostile and compromised, and the internal traffic is considered just as dangerous as the external traffic. This means that everything will be operated under the assumption that there is an adversary currently in the network. This means deny by default, regardless of the user, device, data flow, and request for access. Things will be consistently monitored relating to the behavior when data is moved or changed, and really any changes to the network at all. It's good to point out that this occurs even after authentication has occurred and privilege has been given within an organization's infrastructure. Everything needs to be logged, inspected, and monitored for configuration changes, resource access, and network traffic. The third principle is verify explicitly. All access to resources should be governed by company policies and be authorized based on available characteristics, such as IP addresses, operating systems, geolocation, and work schedule. This means that everything about the user should be taken into consideration before granting access to resources. It's a continuous process of authenticating and authorizing by monitoring who and what has access based on behavioral changes within the network. Traditional perimeter network topology varies from that of zero trust, and a zero trust network takes the perimeter model and turns it inside out. The physical security of the transport layer isn't necessary anymore. Additionally, there won't be a need for VPNs since host placement isn't a factor. And that's also an upside to that because VPNs aren't safe and some say they're just a super secure backdoor into the network. And all that it takes is for a threat actor to get a hold of the user's credentials and they can remotely access a company's network. Let's go over some zero trust protocols. Microsegmentation. Typical perimeter security does a good job with firewalls and ACLs or access control lists when monitoring outside traffic. Outside traffic is called north-south traffic, and internal traffic is called east-west. However, east-west internal traffic can be just as dangerous with the boom of virtual machines, hybrid clouds, and remote work. As mentioned earlier, VPNs can be used as a backdoor right into the network, and it's becoming more difficult to keep things secure. If an attacker finds their way past the perimeter, that's all it takes. In zero-trust architecture, there's something called micro-segmentation. This way, the security is no longer focused on the perimeter, but at the actual workload level. This allows for software-defined policies and security controls. There are content control levels that can allow for multiple users to be on a cloud with different privileges for data. There are even encryption tools that only allow those with the proper authorization to access certain data. And of course, all this will be logged and monitored for anomalous behavior. 
Microsegmentation allows for limiting the attack surface, and an adversary won't be able to perform a privilege escalation and jump into another area, ultimately isolating the attack to prevent further damage. Multi-factor authentication is important for all users, but it's a core piece of Zero Trust architecture. Many networks will implement MFA for endpoint users, but Zero Trust implements it within the network. This creates extra layers of defense and continuously tests users. It requires proof of identity. RBAC, or Role-Based Access Control, is a way to give users specific access and to permit them to work with data within the network. Its main goal is to limit access in the event of a breach. This goes back to least privilege and gives only the permission needed to perform specified tasks, ultimately limiting the attack surface. Identity access management is a tool that an organization can use for their zero trust model. It's used to monitor and control user access with the authorization model being RBAC. An IAM system can even be set up so that users can only access certain systems only during their work hours. This is a proactive approach instead of reactive. Even so, an IAM system will alert for suspicious behavior once a user has attempted to access data that they weren't given permission to. DLP is data loss prevention, and this is something the Zero Trust model can incorporate. Data loss prevention tracks specific characteristics of data, such as the length of a string or numbers to identify things like whether it's a social security number or credit card number. If data like this attempts to leave the organization, it will cause an alert and can either encrypt the data or prevent the unauthorized exfiltration of data from leaving the organization. On to challenges. As mentioned before, Zero Trust isn't a single tool that you buy from a vendor, but it's a mindset and it needs to be taken holistically. This means that everything has to be considered from the ground up. There will be gaps in protection and one big issue is with legacy systems. Legacy systems, which are older, outdated systems and technology found in the network that are still being used. These systems operate and perform the necessary functions for the organization, but they're no longer supported and they're often outdated. These systems might not be compatible or may require excessive cost to implement the zero trust model, ultimately leaving weak points for attacks. Productivity and availability are arguably just as important as the security itself from a business standpoint. When there's a change in access protocols, there may be risk in how productivity is affected. If a user isn't able to access the applications and tools they need to perform their job in a timely manner, it may not seem worth it to an organization to implement something like zero trust. However, making sure it is a good model can mitigate these risks. Zero trust can be set up to respond quickly when changes are needed to be made. A zero trust model isn't like other security solutions that can simply be configured and deployed. That's because Zero Trust is an approach that will require ongoing management. When there's a change to a business, Zero Trust must be considered and implemented into that change. This could include an employee gaining new responsibilities, adding new sites, or other changes. Final thoughts and notes. Zero Trust isn't something that needs to be set up all at once, and organizations typically implement and adopt Zero Trust over time. However, this can introduce security gaps within the network. There are always constant changes within an organization, so you might not see complete zero trust in the network, but this is something that can be worked towards. With that being said, an organization can adopt and move towards a full zero trust implementation with continual maturity. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. Please leave a like and drop any questions or suggestions you may have in the comment section down below. Thanks.